The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. And I believe that uh, with vision, there is timing. There's a, there's a period where you receive the vision, then there's a period where it comes to pass. Now, uh, before we begin, I want to start by reading a scripture from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Anoint your ears to hear. Are you ready? This is going to be Why Vision Part 3, I suppose. <laughs> as long as we're on the same subject, you might as well call it the same title, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship, His way, masterpiece, some translation. We're His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand in order that we would walk in them. So right at the onset, it is clear that God, for the believer, has a plan for your life, and his, it's been established before you had any great ideas. It was established before you were in your mother's womb. How about that? That's before anything you had to mess up, anything you could dream up. And... There's so much confusion, I believe, even in the church with understanding vision. You know, there are many people who are unsaved who are living their dream. You believe that? They set out to do something and they accomplished it, and more power to them. But redemptively speaking, that has of no value in the kingdom of God. And there's many, quote, successful people who on the day of judgment, none of that's going to accomplish. Though they gain the whole world, they've lost their soul. So when I talk about vision, out of Proverbs 29, 18, I believe it is, it says, without vision, the people perish. And that word vision is not just a dream. It's not just something you came up with. It's not your likes or your, something you would like to do, hope to do, think you should do. But basically, it is a redemptive vision. Without a redemptive vision, the people cast off restraint. If they cast off restraint, what do they do? Whatever, right? Whatever they can think of. Some people are going around in circles their whole life trying to find it. But if it's a redemptive vision, and if God's got a redemptive vision for absolutely every person, and He established it before you were born, then how do you find out what it is? You ask Jennifer. No. <laughs> That's what I do. All right. <laughs> how do you find out what the vision is if it was established before you were born? What's the scripture say? You will seek me and find me when you search for me, how? With all your heart. I know the plans that I have for you, it says in Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you. Well, he knows the plans. How are we going to find out what that plan is? We're going to have to seek him and search for him with all of our heart. Because a vision, your vision, the plan that God has spoken for your individual life, has to be a redemptive vision. Redemptive vision means God knows what it is. You've got to find out from God. <laughs> You're not going to figure it out. To the unbelievers, it's going to sound foolish. To unspiritual Christians, it will sound foolish. Believe it or not, because there's plenty that they want to ask Jesus into their heart, but then pretty much don't want Jesus interfering with my life the way I want to run it the rest of the week, okay? Vision for them will be foolish. 
But yet for those who have sought God for the vision that they have for their individual lives and have found that vision, it is the most satisfying place to be on the face of the earth. And not to mention the ultimate reward of saying, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've done what God called me to do. But remember, a redemptive vision means there must be redemption. Uh, pastor Cliff had a good one at our pastor's meeting last Sunday. And we were talking about vision. And he says, your vision, because people confuse their dreams. Unsaved people can have dreams. The way to interpret your vision is if it's the end of your dream or the end of your vision, you are God. That's a real simple way, isn't it? You want to be the world's most famous preacher. I see the end of that vision. I see you. <laughs> but the eternal purpose of God, this applies to everybody. So you can, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what the Bible says is for all of you. That you would bring many sons unto glory. You can't bring a son unto glory unless you're a son. And becoming a son it actually requires you to grow up. You can't stay immature and be a son. You can be a child of God, but being a son is one who has entered into the realm of maturity to where God says they have grown, they're mature. They could, uh, in, in a worldly sense, you'd say take over the family business. Right? You wouldn't give your two-year-old the family business. Right? But when they're mature enough, and you see that there's been a process of development. Well, God's got a process of development for all of us. And I look back, and some of the things that would have seemed foolish, but were real to me, are lasting even to this day. And if you're willing to, to receive this, there is, even in the death of a vision, a burial even a sadness to some of the plans and the dreams that you had because God will reveal something of our character and our nature but then a lot of times he brings it to pass in, in his own time and his own way and it's not usually in our time and in our way. So you get discouraged and you get bummed out and you want to let it go. Well, I want to, I want to cover some of that today uh, specifically because uh, uh, like I said, we want to get you out of your comfort zone. Not that you could be too comfortable here. I don't. I purposely try not to allow you to get too comfortable. But we talked before about Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no redemptive vision, where where there is a dream that doesn't involve God, the people cast off restraint. And if they cast off restraint, some translations say they run wild. It, it reminds me of the, the book of Judges, where the, the repetitive theme throughout Judges was, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. When you cast off restraint, you basically do what's right in your own eyes. You come up with something. Very seldom is there a, a gap. There's always, it's always filled with something. And... If that need is not met by God, you will find a substitute. It will not remain void. Jeremiah is also a good book that describes that. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, as the source, and they've hewn for themselves substitutes, cisterns, that really don't hold any water. And so substitutes are what a lot of people have, and they're sincere. And so you don't want to hurt people's feelings, but some of their dreams and their visions are sincerely been concocted in their mind. If they, if they had their priority right and they were focused on Jesus first and that God is the author and the finisher of my vision, they would get back on track in no time. So, in other words, just like Pastor Cliff said, if you don't, at the end of your vision, if you just see you, that's a bad sign. The end of your vision should be the purposes of God. It should be God exalting. Now, what's, what, why is it even important? Well, for the first place, it gives direction. It gives direction for your life. 
instead of wandering around in a circle, wandering in the wilderness, you need to have a God-ordained, redemptive revelation because God said that he prepared them before you were born that you would walk in them. Don't you want to know if you're walking in it or if you're walking some other way? And he basically says that, you know, if you understood a redemptive vision, if you really had God unfold to you the plan that he has for you, it gives direction, but it causes passion and purpose. A purpose-driven person is one who's been passionately focused on what is important and what is not important. Now, I have a, I have a brother-in-law uh, who married my sister, obviously, and, uh, and my sister was kind of like a free spirit, fling your clothes anywhere you want. I hope she's watching. I'll get, a, I'll get an email. Um, <laughs> fling yourself, whatever, leave it on the floor. Who cares? I mean, life is more important than, than hanging up your clothes. Well, my best pupil ever. I mentored him. He had one glitch, but he was the best of all that I've probably mentored over the years. He was OCD. I mean, he would say things like, I mean, they say I'm OCD, but haven't you ever left the house and wonder if you left the silverware drawer open and turned around and went home to close it? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think I know why they call you that. I can still remember years later, after the first time I prayed him through one victory, he had to call me up, guess what? I went to work and I didn't make the bed. That was one of his earlier victories. But... I believe that God really spoke. Like I said, he, my sister ran from me for many years. She didn't want to hear about Jesus. Even when she was sick in the hospital, I'd go to visit her in the hospital. She'd, she'd pretend like she was sleeping just to avoid her brother going and tell her about Jesus. Well, anyway, she gets saved and comes to my church. And uh, it was much larger than what we have here. And she would go home and call my mom up and, and, and get upset. Dennis preached just to me again. He did that every Sunday he's preaching just to me. And he's doing it week after week. And I said, yeah, I, I stay home and wait. And I say, oh, I can't wait till Sunday because I'm going to really nail my sister. That's, I'm going to really give her the message that's going to set her off. You know? But anyway, eventually she found out that if she went somewhere else, they were speaking to her too like I called them or something. But anyway, I'm saying this because I believe in the spirit this is actually transpiring. He basically, with his OCD, took it to the Lord for healing. I led him through a few healings and he saw some victory. But he had a radical transformation and what he did was, the Lord showed him, I, uh, well, before I even show you, get the answer there, I want to he used to ha be able to pull his car in the garage. You could eat off the floor in the garage. You, he could pull his car into the garage, and if he had trays so that the snow came off the car, it went into the tray, and then he would empty the trays. Whoa. Yeah. In the north, that's a lot of work. And I mean, he would come visit our house. He liked, he liked staying with us. And he'd say, Jennifer, you mind if I clean upstairs? <laughs> and she goes, knock yourself out. Go, go, go for it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, my dad's 95. And he's living with my sister and my brother-in-law. And my brother-in-law bathes him. And I have to go into detail, but there's a lot, that's a lot of work involved with someone with Alzheimer's and 95 years old. It's constant care, and they won't put him anywhere. And my brother-in-law takes care of him. 
But he says what he did with the OCD was he went to the Lord and the Lord said, prioritize. And he put God first. And he saw the time spent in projects that the time spent outweighed the value of the finished product. That's, that's actually a definition of perfectionism. Perfectionism is you spend more time on something than the finished product is even worth. And there's a worth issue in there. And he found it in the Lord and he literally died to all of his previous OCDs and he became OCD for God. And he looked and he, he remembered, I've taught this from the time uh, I was a young pastor, was that basically vision to be properly understood, and it's usually where it's misunderstood, vision is primarily internal before it's external. The Apostle Paul says, for this reason I was born, that Christ would be formed in me. That doesn't sound like most people's dream to me, does it? They're telling me what they're going to do, what they're going to do with their life. Paul saying, for this purpose I was born, to reveal his son in me. If that's first, and he, just like my brother-in-law, he made that a priority, then by golly, everything is in light of, of God and others. And he is fulfilled, he's satisfied. My sister's got a loving husband, which we really had our doubts knowing he was OCD. First time my mom and I were sitting there when she says, guess who I'm going out with? I'm going out with Bob. And I went, Bob, our Bob. Oh, and the first thing, my mom and I at the exact same time said, did you clean your apartment? Because <laughs> if Bob comes over, he'll clean it for you. And she laughed. She says, really? And so she real quick threw everything in the bathroom and hung it on the back door, any clothes that were lying around. And he picked her up, and she says they're driving out on her first date, and she looks up, and there's all the clothes hanging on the back of the bathroom door coming out the window because the blinds are open. God, God knows all these things, though. And he basically changed to where my priority is Christ within. And I know that when God gave me vision, it would, it would be foolishness to an unspiritual person, and it would be even more foolishness uh, to an unsaved person. But I've been living all of these years on the momentum and the hunger, and, the, and it's contagious, right, Jennifer? Because she caught it. And it started out in something that would sound so silly, most people wouldn't even understand it. He showed me... Uh, I was in a person's house, and I looked up at a stained glass window, and I went into like a mini trance. I don't know what else to call it, because it was just, it was just a focus, and God was speaking to me. It was a, an arched uh, stained glass window, arch with three columns coming down, and then, of course, there was the window sill. And God gave me a a vision, a heavenly vision. This is not something you pick. Most of you pick a, a house on the beach and I'm going to have a ministry to, to this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. How about just this? How about getting a picture and saying, that's your ministry? Is, would that be a heavenly vision? Kind of like Moses, a picture of the tabernacle. Oh, man. This, none of this is my idea. But nonetheless, it was God showing me that if you will build or comply, because basically he builds, if you will comply to this, to this vision, you honor God. And when I saw those layers, he basically took me and showed me that the four layers were foundations the bottom one was intimacy. There's no other foundation other than Jesus. Can you picture a windowsill with various layers of wood? Well, in this case, it was four, which is not a typical sill, but four layers. And the bottom one was no other foundation other than the foundation of Jesus Christ. Can you build on some other foundation other than that? This is pretty generic then, what God showed me in that little trance. 
And it worked for me because the first thing I learned was that I was called of God, but my first job was to know Him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of His person because there's no other foundation that I can build my life on. Secondly, He showed me the second level was that everything that God builds is according to a pattern based on a principle. And He says, this is the heart attitude the second layer, intimacy with God, but the be attitudes. In other words, this is what you are to become. How many have read the be attitudes? Hmm? Those are be attitudes, not do attitudes. Be. Out of that intimacy with God, this is the kind of transformation. The third level was the do. And it was Hebrews 6.1, the foundational or elementary teachings of Jesus. And that's simple enough. Hebrews 6, how many are familiar with Hebrews 6? Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptism. Those are just foundations and there's no other foundation you can build on, but they are merely a foundation. And the fourth one was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So that meant that in your relationship with God, there would be a becoming, there would be a functioning in understanding the basic elementary teachings of Jesus, but there was also a respect for fivefold ministers based on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. There was a respect for authority and church structure, but also recognizing that they are on the bottom. It's not a hierarchy of big bosses, it's, it's not a pope, okay? It's basically equippers. And if they're understood as equippers, they're more identified by their function than they are by a title. However, you need to respect it because that's still God's, God's leadership and that's God's structure. But it's on the bottom. In other words, you serve. Servant leaders. Three pillars. The first pillar was reality. That intimacy with God and all of that was not doctrine, it was a person. Remember, no other foundation other than the person of the Lord Jesus. So doctrine was more than doctrine, it was Him. And to the degree that the primary pillar of this structure would be reality. If there is in fact reality, there is then the responsibility to go pillar number two, which was basically transformation. How many people have had revelation but it never changed them? Well, God was clearly showing me if the revelation doesn't change you. I mean, I, I even get a bad witness. Some people say, I went to heaven, I went to heaven, and yet I don't feel like they've been changed and I don't feel no anointing on it. I believe if there's true, deep, rich revelation there, it brings about transformation. People have had visitations from angels and everything. I'll tell you what, they're changed, and you can tell when they talk about it, right? Reality is Jesus. Jesus is reality. Transformation, and then the last one, the third pillar, was basically that this is the structure of my individual life. Do you think this is generic? think this could apply to any believer? Well, God gave me this for, for this purpose. He said, for this temple right here called Dennis Clark. And he said that third pillar is application. In other words, if there is life transformation, it's worth duplicating. In other words, you can't give something you don't have, but if it's real, you can give it away. And that's the way the anointing works. Now, now I'm not talking about the anointing on gifts. I'm talking about the anointing that's coming from changed lives. And then that temple had a dome. Remember the, the, uh, the stained glass window had a arch to it. By the way, do you know that Peter was a fisher of men and that when, they would, when Jesus found them fishing, it was an arch-shaped net. But in this case, the net was the capstone. So now Jesus was the foundation, no other relationship but that first layer. That was the foundation stone, but now the capstone with shouts of grace to it. 
It would be a dome of love, acceptance, and forgiveness, that that would be the atmosphere created out of a changed people. Or in this case, a changed dentist should have a love, acceptance, and forgiveness atmosphere or emanate that. And then out of the base of the temple, Ezekiel 47. I don't know if you could even picture all this. Four layers, three pillars, and a dome. It's not that hard, okay? But that dome was love, acceptance, and forgiveness was the creative atmosphere for a believer. The cross on top of the dome was basically the work of the cross that, by and large, the byproduct of the work of the cross is love, acceptance, and forgiveness. If you look at justification, propitiation, regeneration, I'm giving too much. Uh, okay, all right. But in other words, through the finished work of the cross, you create the proper atmosphere that's coming from you individually. Then years later, God says, okay, Dennis, I gave you a plan to work on you. Now I want you to plant a church. And you're going to teach exactly in that same order. You're going to teach intimacy with God. There's no other foundation. Uh, my first church, they memorized Hebrews 6. That's how they even checked with uh, any false doctrine. They say... Repentance from dead works, is that dead works or living works? Faith, faith toward God, or is that faith in your faith? You know, they learn to make the distinctions. All right, so having said all of that, as far as vision, that is not something you would hear someone say that's a 20-something that's going to tell you what their vision for their life is, is it? I didn't see a stained glass window and then there's thing and these pillars and everything. <laughs> but you know that that is in fact what God used to say Christ is going to be formed in you. There's the external and that's the part everybody likes. Paul says that for this reason I was born that Jesus would be formed in me. But he also says in Acts I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That was the doing, doing what God told you to do. My concern is, is we get the doing ahead of the being. And when God laid out that foundation for me, being trumps doing. It's more important what you are than what you do because too many people are trying to do something to get the approval that they should have gotten from God, not from their activity. All right? Now, true vision motivates and it attracts. Call it a DNA or whatever, but people will just feel like I've got that same DNA. I don't know what it is. So a lot of times your individual vision can never be accomplished apart from other people. So it's very important the people God brings into your life whether you like them or not. <laughs> One thing about vision, it's not about your likes or dislikes. We shared that last week. One person that everybody wanted to choke and kill was a person that was instrumental in, in, in a major part of our vision. So don't let anybody choke or kill anybody else. It's not Christian. They might be significant. All right? It establishes priorities. This is what I saw with my, my brother-in-law. Going from OCD to getting a vision from God that basically, the way he sees it, it's God first, my wife second, and my ministry now is to care for my father-in-law. And it, poured all of the passion into that and he is happier than people that are out running around trying to make themselves happy with their job, trying to find a, a, a beach house and trying to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to travel the world and I'm going to, all of that stuff really is mostly selfish because a vision that starts with God ends with God. If it ends with God then it's basically what your satisfaction will be even when, when, when God was teaching me satisfaction, when I found out that I was satisfied in Him, it 
it incubated a desire to reciprocate. Have you ever had somebody just lavishing love upon you? Don't say no. <laughs> After a while, you can't help but want to reciprocate. Satisfaction works that way. To, I believe that when I found my satisfaction in God now, the primary motivation now is I want to satisfy His heart in everything that I say and do. Does that make sense? You want to reciprocate. If it's real, you want to reciprocate. It's not dead works. It's a reciprocation. You're, you can't give something that we love because He first loved us. You have to first get it before you want to give it. You find that satisfaction in Him, then you want to give it. Now, it establishes priorities. All of a sudden you realize, my goodness, life's been wasted. I've spent a lot of time going around in circles. Those are my, those friends of mine that used to say, where are, you, where are you going? Oh, I'm getting there. Ask them, where's there? They usually don't know. They don't have a focus. They don't really know where there is. But if they would refocus and go back to plan A and say, you know what? If this is all that I have with my life, if this is all my life amounts to, I'm going to live for him and serve him all the days of my life. You start there. You will die to the old vision, and this is what I want to get to. You die to your own plans and schemes, and God will resurrect. It's not too late. He'll resurrect something beautiful for you that you would have never in your own wisdom had the ability to think of it. So it's never too late to start over, but it does start with a sadness. A sadness is die to the old so that God can resurrect the new. I'm, I want to cover this part that, you know, when you have a true vision from God and you get that satisfaction, it, it really defines success. You know you hit the target. It defines success. Success not like the world, because there's people who are successful in the world. You've got to change that word. Successful in the world and they're miserable. They retire and they don't know what to do. It's nothing more amusing than we went to this one place where there were retired CEOs all living next door to each other. And they're all getting in each other's lawn. What kind of fertilizer are you using? What, what, well, who's here? They ain't got nothing to do with themselves, so they get in other people's business. I'll tell you what, if you're a retired CEO, you need to find something in Jesus to satisfy you. Because you're not going to find it getting in your neighbor's yard. Right? Now... You'll know you hit the target. You'll know, and see the funny thing is, if you fulfill your destiny and do what God had ordained for you to do, for the works that he caused you to, want you to walk in before the foundation of the earth, you would automatically have success. People that seek success miss it. They miss destiny. They might be successful because you put your energies to something, you can accomplish things. Look at Babel. They accomplished a great deal putting their mind to it. It's not about accomplishing something. It's about whether or not it's going to burn up hay stubble or is it going to be something that's going to last. Fulfilling a God-given vision keeps us moving in the direction that God has for our lives. All right, but I want to deal with shattered dreams this morning. All right, look at Moses. It was in the heart of Moses. This is where you get messed up with your vision. It was in the heart of Moses to deliver his people, the children of Israel. So in his anger at the, opposition, at the oppression in Egypt, he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite, and so he killed him. Well, that's one way to deliver your people. But the interesting thing is, is that that was really in his heart. God placed it before he was born in his mother's womb to be a deliverer and to deliver his people. I say that the most crushing thing that I've seen in the body of Christ are people who've had a legitimate vision, went about it the wrong way, and then got discouraged and just kind of dropped out. And I'm here to tell you, God is so smart. That's kind of an understatement, right? God is so smart that He can raise your life up out of the ashes and make something beautiful and brand new with it, if you will let it go if you can let it go. But some people say, that's all I know. I've seen people in abusive relationships that won't get out of an abusive relationship because they say, that's all I know. Why not get out of your comfort zone <laughs> and there's something better 
for your life. Right? Now, Moses was forced to flee, live in the desert, where he herded sheep for 40 years. Huh. How many people would say that he probably gave it up? Maybe you've given it up. Maybe you're watching by Ustream. You've given it up. That's okay. Let's bury it and give it a funeral. Huh? Don't bury your relationship with God. Hunger and thirst after Him. Seek Him with all your heart and all your soul, with all your might. But the dream or the way you thought it was going to pan out, let it die. God can do something beautiful with your life, but you've got to let it die. You've got to give it a funeral. Satan hates people that are pursuing vision because they're going to they're, they're gonna rob him of his control. He likes having you beat down and feeling depressed and hopeless and nothing's ever going to change. And for, uh, for believers, the temptation is always to abort because of delay, doubt. Did I hear God right? Maybe I didn't hear God right. And not only that, but when it comes to dying... There's probably people thinking of that of me right now. There's also people that will hand you a shovel. <laughs> Say, bury it. It's no good. That's stupid. That's dumb. There's a lot of successful people progressed in spite of people helping them bury it. But there's a proper way to bury it. And there's a proper way to die. And then there's naysayers that will just poo-poo anything. I can remember as a baby Christian sitting there and at my desk in an office and an unsaved person says, so what are you going to do if this if the shop closes down? I said, oh, I'm going to preach the gospel. And I says, and, uh, and uh, I've been asked to counsel people. I use the word counsel. Because I was having people, even as a baby Christian, before I was pastoring, were asking me to help people. Ha! Huh, a counselor. <laughs> you have no schooling. What think, What makes you think? You could do anything like that. But God had already spoken it to me. And I was already doing it. But isn't that funny? The naysayers can get you to bury it. And God had different plans. There's two kinds. Two kinds Retrievable and irretrievable. Some of your visions, like, I wished I would have had nine kids, and you're 55 years old now, forget it. <laughs> Bury it. Well, some people stay mad at God. They stay mad at God because they didn't get, they didn't, their dream didn't come to pass. And I'm going, let it go. And you know, if your heart was really right, you know, God could send you spiritual sons and daughters that would delight your heart even further than that. But see, we have a tendency to make it our way. But when you die to it, having it your way, don't go to McDonald's anymore. Because they'll do it your way. You deserve a break today. You need to get away. Boy, if that doesn't appeal to the carnal nature, right? Poor me, as I deserve. No, kill it. Because here's what happens. There are those that are retrievable because God says he sees you as infinitely valuable and a bruised reed he will not break. Dimly burning flax, he's not going to snuff it out. So you don't give up. If it's irretrievable, we say bury it, don't live in despair, and dream again. But you will not dream again until you bury the other one. Bury it, let it go, and then open your heart now and say, God, in your wisdom, I'm going to dream again. This is a day of new dreams. This is a day where you've got to understand the dangers of depression. You know, depression is anger. Most people, if their dreams are shattered, many of them dropped out of church, many just go through the motions. But actually, 
if you would take that shattered dream to Jesus and quit dwelling on the life that could have been, should have been, wished it would have happened, and begin to dwell on what still can happen. When it comes to depression, I learned this from Jennifer. <coughs> I always like these questions. If you're depressed, which is anger turned inward, ask yourself, what is it that you're not getting? You'll find the idol. What is it you're not getting? Or what are you getting that you don't want? <laughs> Either way. That's a good one to write down. If you're a note taker, you should write that down because you get honest with God on that and you can die to anything that's standing in the way and dream again and let something new emerge and come forth. But get the old out of the way. The, you can't walk into the kitchen without leaving the living room. In other words, you've got to let some things go in order to get the new. The most painful people that I've seen are people that can't let it go. Can't let it go. The most difficult people are the people that are addicted to the dopamine rush of revenge. That's a dopamine rush. They're addicted to the dopamine of getting revenge. Getting even. Oh, for heaven's sakes, forgive and start over again. It sets you free. I, it doesn't do much for them, but it does plenty for you. And it's the most beautiful gift there is to the body. All right? There's life beyond depression. And I really feel like I'm speaking to somebody, whether they're in this room or, or they're watching by Ustream. Uh, you answer those two questions because uh, you've got to stop believing in your own diagnosis. There's people who have isolated themselves and they believe their own diagnosis. Isn't that sad? I want to help those people. Don't believe your diagnosis. Get a second opinion. <laughs> Go to Jesus. Because that's, that diagnosis is not a Jesus diagnosis. That's a your diagnosis. And there's people living in pain, isolated, all by themselves, quit going to church because they believe their diagnosis, which is arrogance. It needs to humble that pride. Get a second opinion. Confess your faults one to another. You might get healed. Find somebody. Trust somebody. I know people are not trustworthy. <laughs> There's got to be somebody for you that you can open up to. Find them. But God is looking at how we wait. Remember our biggest breakthrough, Jennifer, was we were doing traveling ministry. That's how we were making a living. The finances were starting to go down and there was no speaking engagements and I refused. God told me from the time I was a baby Christian, I don't promote myself. I don't ask for a speaking engagement. And by golly, five months went by and Jennifer goes, I am so impressed with how patient you are waiting. And then two days after that, I had a meltdown. I'm going, I can't help it. Nothing's happening. We got to do something great. And then I had to repent from that. You should have never told me I was doing good at the five-month mark. <laughs> five months, two days, I was a basket case. My honey, you are so good at being patient. We have no work and nothing's coming and no one's calling. And you still have the joy of God. And yeah, yeah. Two days later, right? But God is looking how we wait. Waiting is a test. And the main thing is to get your focus off yourself. You want to get well? How many want to, how many have stuff that you just need to let it go? Raise your hand, really. Let's just die to it today. Because God wants to do something beautiful in your life, but the old has to go. And I'm not just talking about an old idea compared to a new idea. I'm talking about the priority of going after God first. Without a redemptive vision, the people perish. Redemptive means it's got to have God in it from the beginning to the end. And, and if interesting thing is if you put God first, if you were called to be a CEO, if you were called to be an artist, if you were called to be an educator, the funny thing is, is you would flow into it supernaturally better than ever by you planning it yourself. Isn't that interesting? 
God did everything he put in my heart. He did it by himself, and it wasn't in a way that I would have expected. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to have for a suddenly? Be suddenly surprised that God does it in a way that you'd have never thought of. All right then. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, for those watching by Ustream as well, I release and I die. I've just given a funeral for the way I think things should have been, could have been. I'm going to die to that depression, that anger turned inward, that it's not work, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. I realize that that's not God's attitude, that's my attitude. And I relinquish all control and I welcome the work of the Holy Spirit to bring to death and bury that old life of depression, anger turned inward, and I'm going to dream again. I'm going to dream again. I'm even going to ask right now that God starts giving revelation and just give a spirit of wisdom and revelation and a knowledge of what He would have you do. What He would have you, and of course, what He would have you be is more important than what we'd have you do. Is He calling you back to intimacy with God? Is He calling you back to that relationship? Is He calling you back to spending more prayer time? Is He calling you to say, let's, let's, get, let's get hooked up together again a lot better than it's been? Quit looking at all the activity and start looking at becoming. Believe, behold, become, be transformed. In Jesus' name, right now, just say, let, uh, let a, we pray that a spirit of wisdom and revelation would fall forth on each and every individual. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That you would see the hope of your calling. You would see that God has placed uh, you strategically the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. He's incorporated around you uh, divine appointments. Let the scales fall from my eyes and see who God's placed in my life as divine appointments. Even people that I can trust again. Trust again. Renew trust. And that may take time, but I'm going to open up and I'm going to begin again. I'm coming out of my comfort zone. And I'm willing to try and dream again. Cleanse me of all leftover hurt and disappointment. Make me clean inside of all of that. And now God, birth. Birth in me a vision for the days ahead. Birth in me and speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to tell you, 42 years later, God gave me that vision of the dome. Then there was times where I got tarry seven days I'm not even sure where that's at in the scripture. Tarry seven days and I'll show you what I want you to do. And I fasted and prayed for seven days. And then he said, a book. And I wrote my first testimony book. And God orchestrated that. I had no money to publish a book. But I did. I said, okay. I started writing down on notebook paper. All of a sudden, the publisher came to me. All of a sudden, the general overseer of a particular denomination happened to have a printing press, happened to do that as a sideline. God will put it together. You don't figure it all out. You be obedient to God. Buy my field at Anatoth for 17 shekels of silver. My first house, 17,500. vision. It may not make sense to other people, but if God speaks it to you and you obey, first the internal, then the external. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, 
intimacy with God and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.